Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to this special event. We have uh, today Ville Vakuris uh, uh, PhD defense. This starts at noon in the uh, in the old uh, uh, most uh, celebrated place in this university in the in the old building of uh, and the room is S212 and this is at noon. But uh, today we have an honor to have Professor Thomas Olson from University of Tampere to give uh, uh, his talk on sustainability design, making sense of sustainability as a quality attribute of IT. And the guest lecture will last 45 minutes and after, after which we will have uh, time for discussion and questions. Let's give a warm welcome to uh, Thomas. We are very proud to have him here. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. So good morning. Uh, thanks for the kind invitation to Pekka and I'm really looking forward to Villa's defense and, and act, acting or having the honor of acting as the opponent, or one of the opponents today. And that's of course the highlight of, of today. And I thought that since Pekka invited me to give a talk about something, I thought that how about making it some, somehow relevant to the topic of the day. So I, I chose uh, something that I've been, I've been recently pondering quite much myself. Uh, I haven't done really much research on, on ethics, but, but there's been a couple of practical projects and, and basically teaching. So teaching has been kind of my vessel to, to understand these ethical moral discussions and, and considerations about IT and, and well, maybe AI especially. Uh, and I approach it from the concept of sustainability. What that means, I will try to explain that today. Uh, so this is basically some highlights from a, from a course that I recently gave called Sustainable Design. It's part of the new master's program we have at, by the way, it's Tampere University nowadays, not the University of Tampere anymore. <laughs> we, we, I've been giving there uh, or gave it in, in the and the beginning of this year, basically, so-called sustainable design, and it's part of this uh, program of uh, sustainable digital life. So what does sustainability mean as a quality attribute of IT? That's the, that's the topic. About my own background, I'm a professor in human-centered design, so my background is in, in human-computer interaction, kind of information systems research, uh, but taking really a design driven approach. So research through design as, as also kind of the epistemology and, and key methodology in my research. So let's, let's give a kind of a background about what, what I mean with this quality attributes and, and sustainability as one of them. So those who know software development and, and are kind of familiar with these different qualities, maybe you have seen this uh, Wikipedia page with number of or tens of different attributes that define quality. So these are something that uh, are considered as kind of capabilities of a information system. So something that the designers and the developers need to be kind of mindful of. And these, in regard to these, they try to optimize and perfect their systems. So this is just a quick screen capture from, from Wikipedia I, I took yesterday. And you can see there's quite a few of them. And because of the number of them, often you need to do a lot of compromising. So which of these attributes get most priority? Of course, it depends on the context. So what kind of user groups there will be, in what kind of contexts the system will be used, for what purposes, uh, in what kind of uh, cultural context, and, and so on. And basically, my, one of my theses here today is that we should really consider sustainability. I don't know if it's, well, it's actually mentioned there, but, but in a very broad sense, and this kind of moral nature as, as one of these attributes. Uh, and often these are, these can be grouped and categorized in a number of ways. And, and I will not go into this kind of, more into this taxonom taxonomy of quality attributes, but I'm personally interested in this kind of user-centric, human-centric, attributes rather than these that kind of uh, relate to the what happens under the hood, so to say. So if we look at these human centric quality attributes over time, I see, I see a clear trajectory here. 
and probably many of you are familiar with these concepts of of course usability since the uh, like 80s and, and uh, standardized in the 90s so quite well defined specified uh, measurable that often is comprises of these three topics of efficiency effectiveness and satisfaction so that's what we tend we were kind of teaching back in the days and and what the engineers tried to optimize so then maybe 15 years ago we got the or we saw the uh, birth of, of user experience so that was a at the beginning it was a very kind of vague a bit amoeba like concept that nobody really understood but many thought that yeah this is actually quite interesting and, and relevant we should talk more about the a bit broader understanding of user experience so in, including things like pleasure um, sociability playfulness more about the aesthetics so a bit more subjective topic subjective kind of elements to to how how the quality is considered uh, and in this kind of transition from usability to user experience there was a lot of kind of friction and, and even change resistance i think both in the field and and in the academia uh, around maybe 2006 to 2008 uh, nine and uh, perhaps until the the kind of the the iphone came out so maybe that was one of the kind of pinnacles or or uh, manifestations of what is good user experience so then people started to understand yeah this is actually something we need to take seriously we need to kind of think about it as developers and designers so now my kind of main point here is that i think there is an ongoing kind of further expansion of of this human centric qualities and what we call it that's a, that's a good question i i've chosen to call it uh if I get my animations to work. Okay, there's there's some delay. Here we go. So I've chosen to call this sustainability. Uh, I, I, there could be a number of ways. You could of course call that it the, the moral quality or or just ethics as, as we often, often uh, use that term anyway. So it's kind of an umbrella concept similar to, to user experience and it expands the notion of what kind of issues and, and considerations, what kind of requirements we are we are considering. Uh, let me add add a bit of. Again, there's some technical problems with the. Here we go. Maybe I will just ditch this nice remote control. So so we see this kind of a trajectory of the of the scope expanding. So the 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 breadth of of what the uh, developers need to consider. And often, or, or this also means that we are kind of moving from this kind of personal towards societal and cultural considerations, and also from these kind of objectively measurable uh, to much more subjective and quite abstract notions. And in the following, I, I try to kind of unpack that. What, what does this sustainability mean? There are certain pointers there on the slide already, but let, let me go through those in a, in a minute. Uh, another quick slide about these historical trajectories. Uh, just, just very briefly, here you can see uh, about kind of design, design thinking, what kind of uh, eras there have been, what kind of movements there have been in, in terms of design. So kind of, for example, looking at this Scandinavian, having the Scandinavian perspective here. So participatory design is already from the 60s. And then in the 90s, I think there was a lot of, end of 90s, there, there was a lot of attempts to kind of formalize and, and proceduralize things related to, to usability. And how do we kind of, how do we create systems that are usable or offer a good user experience? And I think there's similar kind of a trend going on at the moment. And what Villa is also, addressing basically that how do we operationalize these uh, fluffy vague concepts into into practice and 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 kind of day-to-day -day methodology um, so why is this sustainability relevant i think uh, probably the audience uh, can easily relate to this uh, I, I expect that there's kind of a lot of experts there listening so we all know that yeah human lives lives it's significantly shaped by, by information technology. And we could also call it AI nowadays. 
so on, and, and over the last five to 10 years, we have seen a lot of these adverse effects of, of digitalization on behavior, on our culture, on, on, on nature as well, as well as kind of the society as a whole. And there's this uh, funny, funny law, Moore's law. So that's different than the Mr. Moore with, with an E at the end. So the, this, Moore's, this version of Moore's law says that as technological revolutions increase, also their so social impact and ethical problems increase. And that was already uh, mentioned or addressed in 1985. And as the kind of technology is, is uh, expanding and, and, and sophisticating, there, there will be likely more and more, more and more issues to consider simply because of the pace of technology development. And Wille has a very nice introduction about that in, in his thesis. And then another point here is that we, we tend to, I mean, the laws and regulations, they tend to kind of lag behind. So of course we have GDPR, we have the new AI Act kind of coming in maybe uh, eventually <laughs> in the EU, but there's, there's basically very few laws if you think about globally that regulate that what kind of IT systems can be developed and how they may work. So there's compared to many other industries, there's very, very little regulation. So this is why we should consider these ethical uh, points because I think that ethics is largely the area beyond law and regulation. So, so what people feel is, is important and desirable, but, but something that has not been kind of dictated or defined, specified in, in the law quite yet. Um, so what is sustainability? That's a good question. Uh, I, could, I think we could break it down into kind of two words. F first of all, sustain ability so in a, in a way it's kind of the ability or capability of of to, to sustain something and what what is this something let's discuss that soon but also we can ask that whose or the quality of what or of whom so is it the quality of 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 the society is it the quality of of a designer or of a system i suppose we can think about each of these uh, there are this number of different kind of defi definitions. I will not go through this now in detail, mainly by, by the United Nations uh, who've been kind of uh, advocating these sustainable development things. Uh, everybody has probably seen this uh, SDG or sustainable De development goals, 17 of them. And we could, of course, pinpoint that some of these are more relevant when we think about IT development than, than some others. Uh, for example, maybe the uh, number four, if you can see it, quality of education could be, could be one. Or number five, gender equality. I think we are already seeing these kind of questions about kind of do we want to support a binary gender, uh, notion of gender in, in our IT systems and so on. So this is kind of the overall background that I also gave gave to my, my students on the course. But what's really maybe interesting or Im more important here is the what kind of facets or parts of sustainability there can be. What is the kind of the footprint, possible footprint of, of digital systems? So typically, maybe you have seen this as well, uh, we identify three main facets. So the environmental or the planet-centric, social and cultural, or people-centric and the economic, so profit-centric. And then you can identify these kind of uh, areas in this nice Venn diagram between these, uh, like uh, these different areas. Uh, I will not spend too much time to describe them here. And further on, you can see these different kind of dimensions that whether you, if you focus more on the left, you might focus on kind of this eco-justice uh, level topics. But something that we also discussed quite much with the students is, is, is this missing something? And maybe one important aspect is this kind of health and well-being of, of individual. If we think about users and, and like secondary users of, of we are, the audience is sitting here, for example, except one. <laughs> so, so 
we are easily not using our bodies to that extent that our kind of biology would would desire. Uh, so there are a number of diff, uh, kind of viewpoints that you can take to problematize. Thanks, Becca, for standing up. <laughs> uh, let's see, let's see what I had here. Uh, oh yeah. So, so then then you can of course ask that when you talk about sustainability of the digital. So what kind of viewpoints you can see there? So we can we can look at the, the kind of the culture of living in the digital. So what is it? Is it sustainable to be uh, to live in a digitalized world? And then of course these processes of digitalization. So when we create this uh, transition transitions that we digitalize something, whether it's a uh, processes in work life or or whatnot. And then further on, the kind of the methods and practices that how do we do this? How do we produce these transitions? And I, I think this is exactly the kind of ecological niche where Villa's work also strongly relates to. Uh, here's, a, here's a nice graph um, I just picked, picked for the students and it kind of identifies these different, uh, what would you call them? Dyn dyna dynamics. I don't know if you can see it over the stream. It's a bit small, but so we are at the moment kind of, I, I think we are in this middle of the first dynamic where we kind of try to justify digitalization by the aim of sustainability. So, so we create systems in order to achieve sustainability because we believe that anything digitalized is better than the kind of the analog version of it. And of course, you can question and challenge that. And the second dynamic would be more about kind of thinking about how do we make the digitalization itself more sustainable. And I think this is what we should be thinking much more about now, that as we are making things more digital and, and transferring into kind of digitalized versions, are we actually kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Is, is there some, are there some harms that this process or uh, tra transition to digital uh, causes. And further, you could, of course, kind of in long term, think about this third dynamic of uh, the future of our species, Homo sapiens. So kind of ensuring that we as a, as a species, we kind of sustain no matter, uh, no matter what the conditions regarding the planet and everything are. And there we can think about like super intelligence and this, uh, uh, what's the other? I, I forgot the term I had in mind, but nevertheless, these kind of quite utopian ideas of, of technology and, and uh, humans converging somehow into, into, into one. Do you mean artificial superintelligence? Yeah, well, that was the other term, but then uh, I, I was maybe thinking about this convergence indeed. That was the, probably the term. Okay. The, thanks. Thanks for the. Uh, Okay, but nevertheless, so they, they, sorry, this is a bit maybe still still a bit vague and kind of painting the background, but but I think often we we know that sustainability is, or we kind of acknowledge that yeah, it's important. Of course, everybody is saying that, so of course it's important, and we should deal with that. It's kind of a guiding star, but at the same time, it's I think it's unreachable in in many ways that whenever we meet a criterion or meet a target. For example, one of those SDGs. Uh, then there will be new ones because it's it's part of the human nature and our culture that we always find something to improve. So I don't think we can ever kind of reach this optimum of things being maximally and perfectly sustainable. And often we also define these things through the negative. So we kind of know what is unsustainable. And, and we, are, we can problematize things that, okay, that's wrong. We should get rid of that. We should avoid this kind of a situation, but we don't know maybe that what is the kind of the positive side, what to, what to address or, or try, to, try to reach. So what is actually sustainable? And that, that's of course, I think what happened with, with user experience in the early days or usability, we had a lot of examples of bad usability or bad user experience. But we didn't maybe have a very clear picture of, of what would be a good or pleasurable one and what where to kind of 
uh, what to what to pursue. Okay. Okay. In this course, we we spent quite much. Uh, time to kind of problematize things and, and identify what kind of issues there are uh, with regard to various kind of information technologies. And I, I have a lot of examples here. I, I, I will just take, take some. So this is one of the slides I had there. So I, I talked about these examples of, uh, and, and one more thing is that I think these all examples are all such that where the technology itself has a very strong or it's one of the key reasons. So it's not just that people are misusing it. I mean, it's, you shouldn't just blame the user, but it's part of the inherent feature of the system itself. So we can we see these early examples of kind of people re being discriminated, or we talk about biased systems in terms of race, skin color, gender, these kind of protected attributes that, I mean, in, in the law, they are considered protected. Uh, that I mean, if you, if I suppose everybody has heard this example of when you Google for three white teenagers versus three, three black teenagers, I think this was already in black uh, 2014 or something, you would get very different views. So for the black, it would be these kind of mugshots, arrest images, and, and in the white version, it would be about this kind of happy, happy group of college students. Clear racial discrimination there. Uh, information addiction is something we also discussed quite quite much about. So how we are, how we are kind of, uh, how, how we have be become beings who, that are driven by, by the endless streams of information that we get from online services and, and whatnot. And mainly the smartphone has been the kind of the key, key uh, artifact to blame there. So I think these, these discussions about addiction started probably already 20 years ago and have been just accelerating. Thirdly, what I've been personally interested in, in, in my research is about how do these systems and, and especially smart devices, how they kind of influence social encounters and, and so the kind of conditions in social interaction. So, so here we can see these examples that we are we are distracted by the by the remote connectivity while we are kind of and that that's often away from the connectivity and and engagement with people who are close by who are collocated so these kind of issues and ne next you will see a this is definitely information overload but if we kind of expand this three facets of sustainability uh, and we made this nice examples or uh, exercise during the course that we pinpointed different issues here. So I will just like quickly populate this slide with tens of concepts. So you could, you could kind of map out issues based on these three facets quite, quite nicely. And uh, we discussed various kind of issues. Uh, problematizing, for example, the elect increasing electricity use of, of online services. So if you think about, uh, well, classical example would be streaming multimedia content instead of, for example, using a DVD or Blu-ray disc or something. Uh, of course, Bitcoin mining and that kind of, or other cri cryptocurrency. The social and cultural area is, is very populated and we discussed a lot. Uh, talking about this kind of cultural crisis, for example, that we see often in social media. So kind of how people are, it's easy for them to be more uncivil or, uh, and, and, and even this, this uh, phenomenon of invisibilizing something, someone by, by so in social media, uh, creating fear of missing out, making people more and more addicted in the in the systems that they or the services that they use political polarization and so on and so forth so there's plenty of these things i would happily talk three hours about about these and take give examples i can be if somebody wants to get some references i can surely provide some and there's a couple of nice books for example about this surveillance capitalism and 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 so on so Let's not go into this now, uh, but there's 
just to kind of underline that there's various kind of issues that we can focus on and we can problematize IT in many regards. Uh, just quickly, another nice paper. I just brought this up here because I noticed that Ville hadn't been citing this, so maybe this would be a nice way for, for kind of starting the defense already. Here don't, don't be starting the defense yet and giving hints no, no, to no, Ville. No, 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 but, but by, <laughs> by showing this, I can avoid asking one question. In the All defense. right, very good. <laughs> so, so this is just quite a recent paper by Royakers and others where they kind of uh, categorize these societal and ethical issues of digitalization. Uh, according to six different groups. I will not go through, through this in detail again. So talking about privacy violation, like this pervasive monitoring by all of us. So it's not anymore this kind of a scenario of the big brother surveilling us, but actually it's this little brother where, where we all surveil each other with, with these wearable cameras and wearable microphones and, and whatnot. These sensors that we kind of keep with us. Diminishing autonomy, so kind of diminishing of uh, freedom of choice of, of individuals, uh, even freedom of expression and so on. So we have more and more technologies that, that are trying to persuade us somehow, or they're trying to nudge us. So think about this, do that, uh, choose this. So having all these kind of default options, gamified elements and so on. And that's, of course, a question of autonomy, which is one of the main and most fundamental values for, for human beings often. Freedom and autonomy. He talks, or they, the authors talk about decreased safety, security, balance of power, kind of power moving from the public sector to the private sector, uh, unfair competition, uh, dehumanization and this desocialization that we start to kind of think about each other in less you know, like humanistic way that we we often just in instrumentalize other people or that's that's a kind of a growing tendency that the that the digital era era is kind of maybe speeding up to some extent justice and fairness and so on so this is this is just like one one nice uh framework that I've, I've used myself and, and kind of like. Okay, so that's about the problematizing part. So we, I suppose we can all agree that, yeah, there are issues. So now that we are here, many of our here are interested in also kind of solving them and kind of engineering the, things. So, so the question is that how do we then improve things? How do we create a better world? And here is a slide about the different kind of uh, stakeholders or actors that influence that how IT is developed. This was a nice overview again for the students to think that, okay, we have laws and standards which kind of set boundaries and conditions and the incentives, especially thinking about the, the, the market economy and the kind of um, political and, and economic conditions. Uh, we have the market dynamics, kind of market pull and consumer demand there. So the users themselves, the customers, they are increasingly, at least from my point of view, they are starting to consider that how ethical is a company that I'm, I'm buying my products from or my services from. Uh, that could also relate to kind of procurement practices that how, how organizations buy uh, solutions from, from software vendors. So what, what are the criteria against which you kind of make the, make, make the vendors compete? We have professional norms, we have these guidelines, ACM, IEEE, all of these major kind of societies, scientific associations, they have different kind of norms that tend to be very abstract, high level, uh, not very actionable, as also Ville nicely criticizes. So it's kind of more like mo moral guidance, helping you to calibrate your moral compass in a way. Then, of course, we have the practice and method level. So how the companies or whoever the actors are 
how they are doing their their daily work and again this this is where Ville especially addresses or contributes to and then I think last we have this kind of individual designers and developers kind of virtuous nature so how virtuous are they and and do they do have do they have the courage to kind of champion this ethical consideration in their daily actions and maybe even challenge some some trends and and norms that there are in the field because they believe that there is something something really fundamental let's say human autonomy is being kind of violated here or privacy so i i, I will i need to stand up and and champion this issue and well in this course uh, that i'm talking about this was of, of course for the designers so so not maybe even software developers that much, but the people who kind of deal with the question of why the product exists. So I tried to motivate also that why, why should we then appeal to designers to improve things instead of politicians or the consumers and so on, or, or the, those people who finance startups, for example. So I think design is important because well first of all it has its effects so design is inherently moral and political action and secondly uh, or still about this previous one is that uh, I, I took this <laughs> famous old picture about the peter parker principle uh, with great power comes uh, with great power comes great responsibility so so if you have this power of a designer, then you also have this great responsibility of kind of addressing your users or your customers appropriately. Uh, and then another point is that I think designers often play a very central role in defining that what is the purpose of digital systems. So kind of the why question, why does this exist? What is its strategic or tactical uh, position in the world? What kind of what kind of um, impact is it expected to create and so on so the designers tend to operate between business the end users different kind of stakeholders like societal stakeholders as well as the technical developers they are often product owners or in this kind of positions so i think therefore we should appeal to designers in particular and now we can then ask that, okay, if we think about the work of designers, is there something wrong? Uh, how do we problematize the work itself and how, it could, how could it be better? So I, I identified different kind of like trends and, and like norms uh, about design work. So first of all, as a practice, we tend to value speed and disruption. So this kind of idea of move fast and break things, uh, what, Allegedly, Mark Zuckerberg has said, I don't know if he has, but anyway, that's, this is the ethos of Silicon Valley and, and kind of, this is, what was it, start, startup lab, or what, sorry, what was the startup lab? So this is kind of the, again, about the ethos of move fast and break things. I don't know if you under, understand that or if you agree with that, but this is still an underlying kind of ethos in the field. Becca seems to want to say something. <laughs> Uh, yes, I was thinking that whether whether it's uh, Zuckerberg who said it, and then we all do it, move fast and break things. I guess the ethos is that one should do something to learn what doesn't work, because no idea never, no idea mm. is uh, uh, perfect enough if there is no if if it's never tried out. Yeah, maybe that's the idea. Yeah, that's a bit more positive frame. Framing. And yeah, I definitely kind of, I tend to agree with that. And that's what I have been preaching my students as well for years and years. Maybe the downside of this is that because of the pace and the speed, we often do not have the time to kind of stop and consider and think about holistically, comprehensively think about the different risks and pitfalls that there might be. So in a way, I don't, I don't argue that we should get back to the waterfall model or something like that. But uh, like like the '90s way of produ producing software, but still maybe there could be a bit more time and space for deliberation and, and re 
reconsidering things. Uh, what, what is a result of the previous is that we often tend to follow these design trends and conventions. So we often have, we call, talk, talk about kind of design legacy. We talk about design systems. So kind of existing infrastructure that we, that we build on, existing examples that we copy ideas from. And that of, tends to produce more of what we have already. So actually it's this, this kind of tends to uh, be in uh, contradiction with the previous one that you don't, it's really hard to disrupt things or it's really hard to come up with something new if you just keep on copying existing uh, ideas. And that's also that you copy, copy the problems, you copy the issues that come with these systems. Thirdly, uh, this is the, uh, probably Ville as a, as a theologist remembers Hume's, Hume's, David Hume's gelatine. So this idea of, or this naturalistic fallacy that you shouldn't mix up how things are with, with how things should be. So, and this is often what we tend to mix up that we kind of look at how things are, for example, by the, doing user research. And then we kind of draw conclusions based on that, that how things should be. But there is often this pitfall uh, or, or fallacy that we, we, it's really hard to derive this, what ought to be based on the existing realities. And often you also tend to mix that with, with how you want things to be, because you have your own will and you have your own values. So it's very easy for a designer to kind of embed your values into a system. What else do, did I have here? Let's see. Uh, yeah, we tend to overemphasize the perspective of the individual user over thinking about other stakeholder or the society or culture as a whole. So it's very individualistic in a way rather than collective. There's constantly some issues with my transitions here on the slides. Sorry about that. And then this finally, of course, because they are, we are, those who produce the solutions technologies, they tend to be private sector players. So they are, of course, in, incentivized by market economy, uh, especially in the Western world. So, and this, this has its own kind of drivers. We talk about key performance indexes and, and, and so on. It's all about creating revenue. And often there are these other costs that are much more long-term that are therefore easy to re re disregard. And they are kind of someone else to take care of. Let's say that please government do something about this. It's not our, it's not our thing to deal with. So these kind of things there, there are um, that kind of challenge. I will take one more slide about this and then, then get to the kind of what I think is the highlight of, of the talk. So, so from a book that I really like uh, by uh, Nelson and Stolterman, uh, The Design Way. So they have a really nice chapter about the evil in design. So connecting to the previous slide that, well, how can design be evil? So they identify, uh, recognize three different categories. So first we have this kind of natural evil. Evil that is kind of necessary. It's it's an integral part of the process of change itself. So whenever you introduce a new design, it costs a shadow in a way. And, and also that when, when you do something, it's away from the alternatives. So because whenever you invest something in something monetarily or materially, or thinking about human, human time, it's away from somewhere, somewhere else, obviously. So there are a lot of lost opportunities, lost alternatives uh, when, when, whenever, whenever we do anything. So it's, it's kind of a natural part. It's an unavoidable evil of, of design work. Then there can be accidental evil. And I think this is perhaps the most important in the sense that what we can address, what we can affect uh, by, by education. So, so people 
uh, designers, as we already established, they have power, but often we might not have the understanding of the different risks, pitfalls. So we we might, and and uh, there, there, there can be a kind of misfortune and accidents. So I don't know, again, talking about Facebook, since we already brought it up, nobody could have forecasted that this nice thing that Zuckerberg and others created mid 2000s would affect political lobbying or, or the kind of political landscape across the globe, or, or it would create uh, Diff well, well, okay, L let's not go to the problematizing <laughs> again, but you see that there's this often this unintentional evil that you maybe could avoid. You might be able to avoid if you were just more paying more attention and kind of more mindful of, of the risks. And finally, uh, willful evil is, of course, a very wicked one because. There can be people who are by, uh, in, uh, intentionally aiming to produce some, some kind of some outcomes that are maybe good for themselves, but, but nefarious for the, for the general public. I think this is a, this is a nice uh, framework, again, to understand the dark side of design work and IT systems. Okay, I, I will take one more kind of a model that I created in the, on this. And I think this is quite, or very nicely, also is a kind of a segue to, to Ville's work uh, that we discuss later today. So uh, we were thinking about these levels of maturity. And this is a pyramid model that you know already identify from here. So I think the bottom layer, the most foundational layer here is that and at the most basic level of maturity of understanding these things is that you have to be aware. You have knowledge about the problems, the kind of effects that there might be, and so on. The second layer is, is responsibility. So you, you kind of turn this awareness into an attitude and an action that you kind of think that, okay, we should actually do something about it. I should take responsibility for, for this and try to improve things. Third layer is the practice. So how do we do this culturally? If we think about organizations, if you think about you, your uh, research team or, or yourself as an individual, what kind of practices and habits do you have to, to act responsibly, increasing your awareness and so on? And finally, we have the tools that how do you do that in even more practical level that, that what kind of methods you use, what kind of information, knowledge resources do you uh, utilize and so on. And I think then, then we can identify different kind of issues at these different levels. Uh, and we had a really nice discussion about this with the students that first of all, the, maybe the most obvious issue here at the awareness level, if is ignorance. So basically, you simply do not know or understand things that there, there, are, pro, there are possible repercussions, there are risks. And this is an educational question. So you can address that by education. And that's why we have like research groups like you who are trying to really advocate this. Secondly, you, you can have this in an organization, especially unclear roles and agency. So there's kind of power vacuum. So people might know this or know that, okay, there are these things and there might be a sense of responsibility at the individual level, but nobody really knows that who should, who has the power and who has the, who has the responsibility actually, if, if, or the obligation to act. Is it the leaders? Uh, do we have the speak up culture? Do we have a psychological safety? in an organization that you actually can take this, uh, address this power vacuum. One more minute, then I, I think you want, want me to close soon. <laughs> so then, then you can have this thing called acrasia. So basically you know how things should be done, but you lack this self-control or discipline. 
you kind of act against your own better, uh, against your better judgment. So lack of self-discipline in a way. Two more. Or then you can uh, blindly trust in the tools. So kind of you have methods, you take the Ecola cards or, or whatnot, and you kind of externalize your judgment and thinking to those. So you, you kind of stop thinking because you trust the tools too much. And finally, you might have this kind of a talk do gap. So, so you, you talk about things a lot like <laughs> I'm just babbling here, but not really doing anything. So, so you're kind of failing to put things in practice uh, in, in, in product design, for example, and so on. Okay, maybe it's time, time to stop here. I had a few other extra slides, but we don't need to really go, go there. Instead, I just thank you for the attention. It would be really nice to have some discussion. I also have some, some kind of pointers to upcoming, upcoming things. We have, for example, an upcoming workshop in trust in AI in, that's in Finnish. So if you want to attend that uh, organized by one of, one of our projects, and this is the sustainable digital life program that I, that I mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. I will uh, shamelessly uh, steal the first question. So uh, what is the designers? Uh, I mean, you are, as I have understood, an HCI expert. Mm. So what is the human computer designers role here? Uh, if we forget the developers, software developers, what, what is the, we have here Juhani Risku in our team who always says designers are the kings and the gurus mm -hmm. and they should actually lead the world and, and do uh, a I lot agree. of, and, and you agree, but uh, maybe you could elaborate a bit about yeah. your viewpoint. Yeah, let me take this slide that I, that I had, had here. So, um, so when I, when I was, I, I forgot to state this in the beginning, but when talking about designers, so I, I thought about, kind of refer to people like service designers, UX designers, or even user interface designers, visual designers. So people who are, especially the service designers, they are, they are really defining that what, what this, this system that we are producing here, what is it for? What kind, how does it connect? To the, to the outside world. So kind of human processes, economical uh, processes, what kind of value does it pro produce uh, to whom and, and how? So it's kind of the broad understanding, like, like thinking about software development, it's kind of the people who define the requirements, uh, people who, who create the products or service concepts. So wh what do we do? Or why do we work here in the first place? in a way, they, they address these kind of questions. And I think then of course you can, then it gets a bit more blurry if you move more towards the, the, the produ production. So, so a visual designer or a pe person who deals with the nasty details in the user interface, they, they, are, they have maybe less say about, about the big picture or the why question, but they of course they can define, for example, that what kind of con, uh, conditions and what kind of structures the user interface creates to nudge the user, for example, to affect their behavior and so on. And I'm not saying that the developers, let's say there's a front end developer or a person dealing with the, with the back end or a data model there, of course they have their own agency and responsibility as well, but I just don't happen to know too much about or that much about those. So, so I didn't address these, these roles here. But I think that's a good kind of continuation we could have. I would like to ask about the sustainability concept. Yeah. Do you see that the sustainability concept is just summarizing what is happening on the field or is it providing something new? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, let's take some of these slides. What I what I had here. Uh, I, I suppose what you are referring to this, what is happening in the field, is is maybe the kind of ethical lens and and discussions of AI and IT ethics. So I think there, there's a lot of overlap for sure, and I'm not sure if I can well articulate that. What is the sustainability lens compared to the ethics lens? Maybe if I think aloud 
for a while is that sustainability is of course uh, has this idea of kind of long-term sustainability. So, so we, we should create such kind of systems and, and conditions that are not away from the future, future generations, for example. So we are not kind of violating the rights of future generations, or we are not violating the, 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 na uh, the nature or the planet Earth as our home and so on. So it, it has this kind of more maybe long term and, and um, conservativist point of view that there are certain essential elements that we want to prevail, we want to keep as they are, we want to nurture that, that should not be kind of uh, not, not be uh, compromised. But do you feel that the concept of sustainability is more like academic tool to guide the researchers, or is it providing something to the actual designers, for example? I hope it would. I hope it would. So I, I think, for example, this this model here and mapping these issues on on a, accordingly. I think that that's kind of a epistemic tool to kind of make sense and and understand, map out things. Uh, at least in, in my head, um, I don't know. Do you disagree, or do you see that? I, I generally, if you think about different kind of concepts and what kind of power they have on people's thinking, it really drastically depends on the indiv individual. That what kind of a mind map they have, what kind of what kind of concepts they are familiar with. So somebody might be more familiar with. With, let's say ethics or the concept of morality or or somebody might be more uh, familiar with sustainability especially the environmental that's often the lens that people have by default uh, and since they are more familiar with that it's kind of easier for them to kind of start building on top of that so in a way because we are talking about sustainability so much in the general public the kind of the public discourse it's maybe a nice kind of uh, like a pathway for people into this world of this societal, cultural, ethical problems. I hope I addressed your question. <laughs> okay, hi, my name is Vaishnavi and thank you for the presentation and apologies for being a bit delayed. No um, my question was like, what would you say is the most human centric challenge uh, that acts as a barrier in sustainability for IT companies? Uh, human centric challenge that would be the most essential barrier. Um, that's a great, great question. I'm, I mean, you, you can take so many viewpoints here. Uh, maybe if I put my kind of uh, armchair sociologist hat on. I, I think this kind of digital divide is a very central concept and very important. So kind of how do we distribute the benefits of digitalization? So we are seeing, uh, if we think about the companies of, well, Silicon Valley, namely, and IT companies, they are the largest in the S&P 500 and kind of the global, if you think about the global uh, finance market, yet they are employing less and less people. If you compare it to the to other industries like the automotive industry or whatever more hardware centric industries back in the days, they would provide a lot of jobs for people. And since we are living in a world that is based on each individual being part of the, uh, the labor force, so if we kind of deprive people of their chances to be employed, in, in companies that produce the most value, that's, that's a very, very kind of uh, central source of social unrest, I think, possibly. Please. Uh, Vaisnavi wants to continue. I give her the mic because sure. otherwise okay. people... So Vaisnavi has a, a continuation question and people in this Zoom can add a, a final question if they want. Vaishnavi. Uh, so what you said about like uh, people being less employed or uh, so my question was like now we speak about digitalizing the processes. So do you think the human or the people factor of the triple bottom line is kind of the diagram is getting reduced on the social side when we speak about social and cultural factor in this case? 
Do you think digitalization of the process is doing that? What do you think about it? Okay, so can you elaborate? Is it doing what exactly? I, I, uh, I missed that. So you just mentioned like, you know, people who should be employed aren't getting employed. So my question was, we are talking about digitalization of processes to gain sustainability. Mm -hmm. And while doing this, we are eliminating so many roles that human used to play, like a people play in this process. So do you think when we speak about, because triple bottom line is such an old framework in sustainability mm. so do you think that the one part which is like people element of this diagram is kind of reducing or it's important is diminishing as we go ahead mm. yeah I, I, that, that's a great question and and i think if we look at the if we try to prioritize these three facets here so i think they they, they have different like temporal uh lenses so in a way i think the most kind of conservative and most long-term uh, sustainability aspect is the environmental. So, so that's kind of a, a question of thousands of years, probably millions of years. Well, I don't know if the human species will survive millions of years, but anyway, we, we want to leave, maybe we want to leave the planet for the, for the rats and ants, <laughs> no matter what happens to us. While of course the societal and, and social uh, cultural issues, as well as the economic, they tend to be a issue. So we talk about, for example, the digital divide question. So how do we distribute or redistribute the wealth uh, and turn that into well-being of, of maximum number of people? That can be away from environmental sustainability, because if we grow the, the so-called the middle class, so people who can travel, who can buy products, that of course increases, increases the burden to the planet as well. So, and this is a question of politics, of course, and the, poly, uh, the, the economic systems that we have. And those tend to be really, really wicked and, and challenging to change. I think only by revolutions or by wars, we have seen political systems and kind of regimes to collapse and, and, and rebirth. Re, uh, so, so in a, in a way, that's probably a, these are wicked, wicked, really challenging to affect. While I think these would be fundamentally maybe the most important in the most long long term. You have uh, this. This is the final question, and then I promise that we end. So uh, 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 you have now kind of uh, put the umbrella term sustainability on on top of yeah. all of this. Yeah. And now we give you a chance, 27th of May, 2022, to give the next term after sustainability. So what is the term that would characterize, in your mind, that could be the next sustainability that we could start working right now? Uh, so Thomas Olson, oh, here, Tampere the, University predicts, the, prediction. You're trying to do this espionage activity that tell me the answer very, on what we very secretly and nobody will hear this. <laughs> yeah, no, but, uh, well I, I don't have any any idea of the next thing i think in a way i could think that isn't this plain enough and especially thinking about the practice of software uh, development isn't this plenty enough considerations for for people to keep in mind and try to deal with so in a way this is already probably too much for any individual company or individual expert to to ma master uh, but what would be beyond this i don't know it could be then maybe something about this multiplanetary user experience or just kind of tongue-in-cheek type of answer ladies and gentlemen uh, when 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 we have kind of Elon Musk, Musk has uh, enabled us to be multi-planetary species. Then I present you, else. Thomas Olson, Tampere University. Thank you. Thanks, well, Thank pleasure. you. And this concludes our special session. See you all at the Defense in two hours. Thank you so much. Thank you all.